Hello and welcome back to the Dicebreaker podcast. This is episode 18. Uh, we are 17 going on 18? That's... Wait, no, that's not the song. No. I've already I've I, already fluffed well, it. For, they, forget they, what you heard. They cycle through more ages, so mm. that's fine. But the yeah. podcast can have a pint in the UK. Oh, I was going to say that. I was going to say um, if the podcast was a person, then Johnny and Matt would be taking it for a pint for its first pint, <laughs> yeah. knowing full well that the podcast has been drinking for several episodes behind yeah. their back. But it's been oh, drinking yeah. WKDs behind you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the local village hall or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if you're in America, you'll have to wait three more episodes before you can uh, legally have a drink because it's 2020 and indeed weeks feel like years. Um, I am Matt Jarvis. I'm the editor in chief of Dicebreaker. I'm joined today by three of the team. I'm joined by Johnny Chiadini, head of video for Dicebreaker. How are you, Johnny? I'm all right. Uh, it is 2020, as you said, but it certainly I, am, is. I draw breath and that is enough. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> keep it light, keep it light <laughs> Sorry, yeah, bright and breezy, bright and breezy <laughs> Keeping it light is uh, Alex Lolis Who joins us from the video team How are you Alex? Hello, I'm well, it's sunny today And I want to run outside and frolic <laughs> <laughs> Watch out everyone Lolis is going to run outside and frolic well, I won't. I'll do it on like We've got a little rooftop area Where I will do that Maybe. In my own yeah. privacy. How you spend your lunch hour is up to you. <laughs> uh, and finally, rounding out the team this week is Alex Meehan. Uh, how are you, Meehan? Uh, I am okay. Um, it's been a week. Fantastic. Filling uh, out the spectrum here, we've got Johnny down at the end of Oh Christ 2020. We've got Lowly's frolicking on the roof. And then Meehan, who's just kind of dead set neutral. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm the middle, I'm, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm the middle ground in this scenario. I, I don't That's know where it. Matt is, he's just floating above it all. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wherever the wind may take me. Uh, this, <laughs> this week's episode will be a slightly shorter episode than usual, um, because essentially it's a very busy week for the Dicebreaker team, um, so we're, we're squeezing in what we can, but there'll still be plenty of board game chat, RPG chat. Uh, we'll hopefully get to a couple of your yeah. questions before the end. Uh, it actually turns out that this week is has a lot of news, so let's roll on. Um, but first of all, let's, as we usually do, ask the team what they've been playing. Let's start this week with Lolis. Lolis, what have you been playing? Well, it's funny that you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I would play we, some here's one I prepared. We do this every every podcast. <laughs> That's why I have the game handy. <laughs> We're playing some Fort, which I'm very excited about. Um, and then <clears throat> um, also some Big Potato games. Uh, disclaimer, I used to work for Big Potato, so I have a bunch of Big Potato games um, from that time when I used to work there. But I played uh, Weird Things Humans Search For and um, Color Brain, I think. Yeah. Oh, I know um, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I had I, I played some games this week, guys. I, I did good. I also, I actually am really upset I didn't put it beside me to hold up to you. Because do you remember I was talking about Tobago a couple of weeks ago on the podcast? Mm. It's like one of my favorite games. And I finally got myself a copy of it. Um, after years of being like, I should really get myself a copy of it. Uh, I haven't played it yet um, because it arrived in a terrible condition. Because I got it secondhand. Um, but it was like, it was like described as being like, you know, good, good use. But it was like, there was dents everywhere. The cards. Oh my god. I'm sorry. I have to show you the cards. The cards in the are not like a deck of cards with rubber band around them. They've just taken a mess of cards, put a rubber band around it as is, like as a mess. <laughs> I'm like, how have you sent this to me in this condition? Sorry. Anyway, I'm very excited to have the game and to play it. <laughs> yeah, we'll put a we'll put a, a little forum post out there. How how can you do this? On Twitter, on, uh, when this goes out, so people can have a look. Because Who did this? Boy or oh boy. I do feel like "good" is one of those words where you look at something. It's like good condition, mm. and there's there's such a range mm. in good. It's like yeah, yeah technically it's still definitely... playable, great game, but covered in orange juice or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they literally bend all the bits are there, which mm. I actually haven't checked if they are. Um, other than that, it's just like crazy dense which i don't even know how you get that dent into a box that kind of dent it's like it hit a rock or something did it fall off a cliff i don't know so yeah. maybe um 
Maybe it's actually cursed, and like this person has tried to get rid of it in a multitude of ways. Look, we all know you've got a copy of Atmosphere now. We all know you're a bit worried about it. This isn't how you pass it on. It's not like the ring <laughs> trying to pass on your board game specter to other people. It's more like Jumanji or Zephyra. Or the Sisterhood of the Travelling Pants. Well, they're not cursed, are they? They're lucky or something. They're, they're just pants. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, me and as you've you've already uh, started this conversation, what have you been playing lately? <laughs> Not Jumanji, um, thankfully. Uh, I've been playing like Lolis. I've been playing Fort. There it is for the listeners. Lolis is holding up Fort, <laughs> like I did last week. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, and I've I've now played it with Mr. Jarvis because it's up on Tabletop Simulator mm. for free. Uh, it's an official mod, so you don't even have to feel bad about downloading it. Um, but it's quite good, isn't it, Matt? The the mod. Yeah, it's 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 very like neat, but there are just a few things. So there's kind of all the slots for okay, your your yard cards go here, your the cards you play go here and then there were just a few things where it's like where does the trash when do, where do the trash cards go there's no slot for that just there's no, there's slot no for bin that. yeah like the yeah. lookout doesn't have any slots <laughs> and it's kind of like oh like it's weird to have 90 percent of the things neatly kind of slot into their places and then just go oh, oh, chuck these on the table somewhere i guess because oh. doesn't the lookout slot under your player board when yeah yeah usually yeah. But you can e do that in Tabletop Simulator. Cool. Uh, there's no space to just, put the cards under. Just spawn in a Viking or a Manticore and stick the card under that. <laughs> That's what I always do. I, I mean, you know what, Matt? I think we missed a trick there. Why did we not think of the Manticore or the um, Viking? If they release an expansion that is just fantasy creatures but made out of macaroni... <gasps> um, that you can then add in. The one really good thing about the mod is that there's actually a macaroni sculpture in it. Like, in the what? physical game, no it's just a... Yeah, in the oh, physical game, it's so just cute. a card. I think that's, like, the one, you know, majorly big thing they missed out on here by not putting an actual macaroni sculpture in the box. I don't know how much it would have increased the production price, but just a tiny bag of macaroni in every box. <laughs> you have to build oh, it yourself. Oh, you can make one. Condition oh good. Some weevils. <laughs> Some weevil. What is a weevil? They're tiny, tiny bugs. I, <laughs> my wife and I found some in our flower the other day, and we had to yeah. just empty out the whole cupboard. They love getting in the flower. They yeah. absolutely bloody love it. They're technically they edible, like, but not recommended. They sound like a cartoon character, like from a children's show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, yeah. Little, little tiny beetles. <laughs> Uh, then they're different from earwigs. Yes, then they're, they're not. They're not like they don't have segmented bodies. They have, you know, they're, they're just little teeny tiny beetles. Yeah. Um, the wonderful we had a world of bugs. Of them once, at one point, but I got rid of them all by killing them. Uh, the weevils does sound like a support band for the wurzels. The wurzels, yeah. Is that who did? I've got oh, a brand new gosh. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah, you <laughs> bet. And uh, I am a zyder drinker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is it is it unsurprising that I know about the Wurzels or yes. not? Yeah, no, that's exactly on brand for you. <laughs> My friends used to sing it when we were like 16. What world did I grow up in? Yeah. Uh, Some sort of time England. capsule. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so four. There you go. Perfect. Johnny... <laughs> What have you been playing? <laughs> uh, I reconnected with Splendor this week. I haven't played Splendor in years, but uh, I played the digital version um, on a live stream uh, with comedian Steve McNeil. Uh, he does a, a stream called Game Overboard. Um, and he was like, what should we play? I was like, well, how about Splendor? And then he, he read up on a strategy guide. So I went on this stream, and the first game, he absolutely wiped the floor with me and talked <laughs> a really it. good game. He was like, oh, Johnny, you've, you've done yourself there. <laughs> you know what you've done there. I'm, I'm absolutely having that. And he got right inside my head. Uh, and then I rallied in the second game and won. But um, I just forgot how nice that game is. Like, mm. it's, you know, it it's not mind-blowing. And in terms of, like, two-player engine builder games, there are newer ones that I would definitely choose over it, like Seven Wonders Duel. But uh, it was just lovely to sit there and sort of just 
clack about a bit. And the thankfully, the digital version has the proper sound effects for the chips. Oh. Because Splendor is my go-to game whenever I talk about a, a game that is good, but is made great by the quality of its assets. Because if you've never actually picked up a physical copy, all of the chips that are used for currency, which you're con- constantly trading back and forth with sort of the pulls on the board, are proper clay poker chips. So it's just a delight to be like clap clap clack stack 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 stack, um, and yeah, it's it is very nice. So mm. I'd say that's the highlight. Apart from that, it's the usuals: a bit Deadlands, a bit of Warhammer, no softs in the loft, unfortunately. But yeah. oh, um, yeah, I am well. seeing some friends this weekend. So yeah, I'll take some softs. I'll, yeah, I'll report softs. back next week. Oh, definitely. <laughs> that's Fantastic. me done. All right. Uh, and yeah, I, so I played a bit of Fort, as me and said. I finished off Pandemic Legacy Season 0 ahead of a <gasps> review next week on August the 5th. That'll be going next live. Week. Next uh, week? And I can't say anything about it other than I thought it was good. You thought? That's about as much as I can say. Um, you but, thought, <laughs> Mr. Jervis. Matt, um, you thought it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Don't don't mix these games. Sorry. Don't do that. <laughs> Three swings at it, but it was worth it. Yeah, that doesn't yeah, yeah, yeah. my accent. Yeah. Matt, I thought Matt, Matt, I Truly thought da- chopping Dad. down a tree with a butter knife. <laughs> <This is to laughs> uh, Matt, 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 Matt. Me and Scott you, something to say. Matt. You, you, you <laughs> thought. <laughs> For a so, sake, guys. So, Pandemic well, Legacy, Season 0, it's it's good. I think is as much as I can say without going into detail and whatnot. Our, our review, for what it's worth, will be spoiler More free. More on that but, later. Um, oh my god. But I also did, I, I very much enjoyed Fort as well. Uh, not least because I won during my first game, which is always a, always a plus. Yeah, not that I'm bitter or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Me and was like, oh, I've won every game so far. And then bam, I did not say swept that. Swept in. You made that fort fly. Liar. Picked up the macaroni sculpture. Oh Smashed it against the wall. I nice had all thought. the friends. It would be a shame if someone kicked you out of the tree. I had Dash and I had the one that eats glue. And I had the one in the ace. I had Bug in the little uh, raincoat. They, mm. they were all in my fort. Mm. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I had all the cool kids in my in And then my I fort. took them off you. As you I do bet you even, I bet you even trashed one of your best friends, me, and that's. I, I actually that. did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Serves you right. Serves you right. Well done, Matt. Great win. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> and it's worth saying that we we all played Blades in the Dark. Oh yeah. Uh, very oh, yeah. recently. Um, <laughs> which will be up for the Metaverse, which is <gasps> taking place next month. Um, which is an event run by Repop, which is the company that owns Dicebreaker. And we will have a session of Blades in the Dark. I can't remember when it is during the Metaverse, but if you check out the schedule, we'll be on there. And then that will lead into a, a kind of a mini series, a kind of free, free part run. Um, because, yeah, Blades, Blades in the Dark, oh, it's, it was my first time playing. And boy, howdy, that game's it's pretty boy, good. Howdy. Oh, I love it. <laughs> It's, it is great. Boy, it's, howdy! It's, uh, it's, they say it's, in Duskville. It's it's a little bit to get your head around the different systems and how they can help you. But the minute you do, mm. it's you've got so many options in any given moment. Whether you're taking damage or you're trying to do stuff or just trying to increase your chances of of getting by on a simple roll, it's it puts so much control in the player's hands. It's great. I like it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Boy, and that was howdy. Will was GMing for us, and I thought, uh, yeah, that, uh, the adventure he ran for us was very good, and I yeah. was genuinely kind of intrigued and excited to see where it ended up. Wheels is a uh, fantastic GM, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like, even just thinking about the one, the the Lasers and Feelings one he ran, like, that still stays with me, that adventure. Yeah. He does, he's, he's good. I have to say, though, I spent two-thirds of that, uh, that place in the art recording not wanting to continue, because he'd put us up against Lord Skurlock, who in Blades, if you you read the book, and I've, I've GM'd this game a lot, I never threw him at my campaign, which ran for over a year, because I was like, no, this guy's too tough. <laughs> uh, so we were in there, and I was like, are you are you kidding me? We're, go- we're going into Skurlock's house to rob him. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was livid. <laughs> I was <laughs> genuinely livid. Wheels has the audacity to do it. Yeah, well, yes, mm, indeed. It's- yeah. A Will's Elian move. Um, 
Uh, while we're on the subject of Wills, he's he's been with Dicebreaker a whole year now. So <gasps> shout out to Wills. Happy anniversary! Congrats. Happy anniversary, yeah. Wills. It's good to have you here. Uh, as it is with everyone, here. obviously. But uh, well, I suppose, oh. Johnny, Johnny, you would have probably beaten him to the punch. So also, yeah. congrats uh, on joining Dicebreaker. But... 24th of July is mine. Oh. No, wait, no, that's not right. 24th of June. Oh. Is that right? Yeah, because le- um, my last day on your again was the 21st of June, and that was a Friday, so yeah. So it's uh, 24th. Oh, well, congrats to you as well. Happy yeah. anniversary! It was, it was lonely and horrible being by myself and just being like, oh. okay, how do we make a whole website? <laughs> uh, it was yeah. odd. So yeah, when Wheels turned up, it was, it was very refreshing. So yeah. I had someone to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Anyway. <laughs> Wheels, someone to talk to. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, shall we roll on to news? Let's do it. Let's yeah, it. I quite can't wait, news to get through. So um, the there's quite a few headlines coming out of the Fancy Flight's in-flight report, which is kind of their periodic <laughs> announcement thing, which has a really, really dull name. Uh, but there's some interesting stuff coming out of it. Uh, ahead of Gen Con, which is this weekend, um, mm. which is worth saying we'll be making appearance at. Look at us. <gasps> we're dice breakers all over the place. Um, we'll be we playing in more yeah. ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the video team played Codenames with Pro ZD. Um, yeah. Which will be on July 31st, I believe, is when the stream goes up for that. Um, so well, that's to- well, But that's today. That- that that's today that's when this podcast is live. Yes. Release. Yes. Friday, July 31st. Uh, so yeah. tune in for that. Mm. Uh, it sounds like you had a pretty good time. So It was great. I was a little starstruck. Genuinely. Like, I I think someone show is amazing. Um, and then afterwards, he followed Wheels on Twitter. <gasps> yeah, me too. Follow- <laughs> Did I follow you? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, howdy. <laughs> That's, that's fine. <laughs> Don't that's make boy howdy your face. Doesn't matter. So, on, if you're listening, it's cool. I understand. <laughs> anyway, <Wow>. this news, <laughs> uh, the in-flight report, getting getting away from from, from all that. Uh, <laughs> there have been so there were there were a few rumours and leaks that started to to pop up um, over the past few weeks. Um, among the biggest was a new Twilight Imperium expansion, mm-hmm. um, which originally popped up as a sales sheet. Um, and it looked it looked legit. It seemed to be all on the level, but they Fancy Flight has now confirmed that mm. that leak was in fact accurate, and it's called Prophecy of Kings. So it's the first expansion for Fourth Edition uh, Twilight Imperium, and it is a hundred dollars. It's oh a God, big God, old it's box. Face. Yeah, it's, I know. <laughs> it's it's a lot of money, but it seems like there's a lot of stuff packed in mm-hmm. there. Um, so there's seven new factions. I think it pushes the player count up to eight. Um, there <laughs> are does. mechs. Uh, there are uh, wormholes. I can't wormhole remember. nexus. That's the one, which oh. was a thing with expansions in TI three. So now it back. Mm-hmm. I really so. wanted you to say worms. Just, <laughs> just, just worms. You, yeah, just you get worms in the box. <laughs> so yeah, condition uh, good. Some worms dead. <laughs> Some worms. <laughs> Worm ghosts. Uh, so yeah, it, that essentially what was what was leaked before was pretty much on, you know, on the money. Um, that'll be out later this year, um, November, I think. Uh, and like I say, it'll be a hundred dollars. It sounds like it's bringing a lot to that game, which is already a, a whopping, yeah, a whopping great big box. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's here's even more box and also stuff inside for you. Uh, also, also leaked was a new Descent game. Uh, Legends of the Dark, uh, which I think we chatted about on this podcast before, because it was it was mentioned in the description of a tie-in novel due out in f- next February. Yeah, uh, and then it, that mention was quickly removed, um, <laughs> and then it just said, "Oh, it's based on uh, Descent. People love Descent, right?" Mm-hmm. Um, so this was right at the end of Fancy Flight's in-flight report. Uh, the last ten seconds, a uh, the the host stood up. Um, and pretended that they'd gone off air and then held the box uh, with the cover straight to camera and was like, oh no, the big one, we've accidentally teased it. That kind of thing. But so <laughs> all we know I from this it. is it's called Descent Journeys, Journeys, uh, sorry, Legends of the Dark. Um, 
That definitely sounds like something I would do. If we were like leaking something, that sounds like a me idea. The <laughs> thing is, they must have already known it leaked. So why were they making... I just I... don't understand why you would make such a big deal of revealing it when you know that... It, well, it wasn't a big deal. I think it was probably more that it got leaked out there. There were already people talking about it. So this was an opportunity for them to, you know kind of acknowledge it but maybe they don't have a lot to say right now if it's not due out till next february um, which is when that book is due out they haven't actually put a, a release date on it so it could just be like a hey we have to address this somehow but we can't do anything more than show this box and go it's really big um i don't know but but that that's that's the short of it is there there's a box it looks big it's called descent legends of the dark uh, there were a load of other things in there, Star Wars Armada releases, Star Wars Legion releases, X-Wing things. Um, there's a, a new X-Men game, um, a Mutant Insurrection, which is oh. a card dice game, which looks a lot like Elder Sign, the Arkham Horror dice game, if anyone has oh, played yeah. that. Oh, I like that game. Yeah, so that's out Q1 2021. I um, hope it has Gambit in it. It does, actually. Gambit was one of the characters confirmed for it. So, Yay, um, a Nightcrawler. The I don't think they mentioned Nightcrawler, person. but... I assume, I assume that Be- Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler is in there. better be in there. Why is this going to be letters will be sent? If not, I'm sure Nightcrawler will make an appearance in an expansion at some point. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a dice game. You throw dice. You they do have the Blackbird. So the Blackbird looks like a little cardboard version that you fly from Xavier's School of Mutants to wherever you need to go. You apparently there are different scenarios based on various different comic book arcs. Um, so there's Magneto in there. There's some others that I've now forgotten. Um, Saber, Sabertooth? I don't maybe? think Sabertooth was mentioned. Um, what about that frog guy? <laughs> Toad? <laughs> yeah. I, d- I don't know. I mean, I didn't announce X Men Res- Insurrection. I'm just uh, I'm merely reporting on it. I'm just asking Toad. the questions. Yeah, I'm just asking the questions of the audience. <laughs> I'm probably going to be asking. If, you, if you'd like to find those answers, you can find them on dicebreaker.com once the story is live. Um, that means you, Mian. <laughs> yes, please read our website. Uh, I, I will comment on it. For, Mian, comment on this. There's a new D&D revamping of Curse of Strahd. I know. You I wrote, wrote the story. story. Yes. <laughs> Tell the audience. This is how this works, Mian. You wrote the story. You talk about it. It's, it's yes and, not no but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the Curse of Strahd adventure. Adventure source book? Um, which which is in itself a remake, rewrite of uh, an original um, first edition source book um, called Ravenloft. Um, Curse of Strahd is like, takes that and makes it 5e. And changes some things about it, and that was released a few years ago, mm-hmm. uh, not that long ago. Um, and then this new version is basically coming in a fancy coffin-shaped box. Um, there are some new like additions, like a, a a screen for your GM with nice artwork on it, and some some cards. That I think you can use to help drive the story along uh, and some postcards you know like you can send them like you're in Ravenloft <laughs> just send one to your parents um, and there are rewrites in the book as well so uh, there's some additional monsters that are being added and there's some rewrites around the human variant race called the Vistani mm-hmm. um, uh, because d uh, and Wizards of the Coast are uh, attempting to make some changes around problematic elements of their past source books, etc. So it'd be interesting to see what differences they put in there. Yeah. And that's about it, really, yeah. That is about it. The The whole box is, uh, again, $100, which, yeah. let's say, sounds like quite a lot for a DM screen, some books and some postcards. It's a It comes in a fun, coffin, there, but... though, Matt. Yeah, but there we go. Uh, so that is out this October, I yep. think. So in time, in time for Halloween. Indeed. 
moving on from that, as we're whizzing through this news, look at it whizzing by. Whew, there goes another one. Um, <laughs> another one bites the dust. Uh, Condition good, some dust. <laughs> there's a there's a a new companion app for Warhammer Forty Thousand out. Um, so this has been in the works for a while. I think it's been pretty long anticipated, uh, and it is it's essentially a rules app. So. It includes the ninth edition. That's their latest edition that came out this month. Uh, the rule, the core rules for that for free, um, and you can look up various units and kind of get the latest point values and whatnot. Um, there is also a premium subscription. I think it's four pounds a month. Um, Correct. That then lets you access eighth edition rules um, for some of the codexes that aren't in ninth edition yet. Uh, lets you, I think the army builder is locked behind the premium tier. Uh, the army builder is not in there just yet, but it's coming. Um, and some other bits and bobs, like being able to search more quickly through, like reference certain rules. Um, you can add, so the codexes, you'll get codes and you can add them that will unlock all the rules. That's part of the free version. Um, it's worth saying here that, so it's, it's out on Android. It's coming to iOS very soon, says Games Workshop. The reviews have been... I think it's fair to say universally negative. Oh dear. Um, yeah, it's it's not so much come out as limped out yeah. of the gate. Um, so as as of writing the story on the Dicebreaker website, which was a couple of days ago when it uh, came out, uh, there were two and a half thousand reviews, and the rating was basically one star. It was just over one star. Um, so there's kind of criticism of the fact that the rules are organised by book rather than by army or faction. Um, apparently it's very hard to unsubscribe once you've subscribed um, from from what I've read the core rules that you get for free uh, for ninth edition uh, under the free tier that it is basically a Google Doc PDF um, <laughs> so yeah so you can obviously download it for free you can check this out yourself um, but it's worth maybe being aware of some of the um, the issues that users have raised. Um, before you go in, hopefully they'll update it because obviously it's it's something that I think Warhammer Forty Thousand, you know, it's it could bring some really good features to it. Like I say, there's an army builder on the way. It's kind of a good way of getting of keeping up to date with the latest rules and so on. But it sounds yeah. a bit a bit of an unfortunate start. Yeah, I've had some sort of emails from from Games Workshop being like, here it's, we're working on a lot of the things, and they're kind of it is something they're keen to support seemingly. But yeah, it is it is safe to say it's had an inauspicious start. Which is a shame because I think it, you know, it, it serves a good purpose. Um, like quick rules ref is great, especially if the person on the other side of the table has the book and you don't. You can both look stuff up, and also like the rules, the the points values. That's basically for if you're playing match play, it's basically your shopping guide. So how much do I need to spend, or how many units do I need to get in order to put this size army together? Uh, and currently, the only other way to do that is to buy the uh, Munitorum field guide which is bundled with the 2020 core missions pack um, and it's 25 quid. So 25 quid versus, you know, dropping, well, either no money or four quid a month on, on the app. Mm. It's not a bad shout in theory. <laughs> uh, That's my my 40 cents. 40k oh. cents. For- my 40,000 cents. <laughs> Your 40... <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my Please. goodness! I really regret this now. I'm so sorry. Wow, this like no, a no. viral this marketing campaign for Fort, off the back this of the, the Alexes. Uh, right, let's let's whiz through. Speaking of Games Workshop, um, anyone remember Hero Quest? Anyone ever played Hero Quest? Broadsword. Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> Uh, board game from the 80s, Dungeon Crawler, kind of one of the very first Dungeon Crawlers, or at least modern style Dungeon Crawlers, very much, let's make D&D as a board game, uh, that'll make a lot of money, won't it? Uh, so it was a team up between Games Workshop and Milton Bradley, the big old uh, board game maker in the US, uh, came out in 89 I think, um, was followed by Advanced Hero Quest, and then eventually kind of morphed into Warhammer Quest, which survives to this day, although Hero Quest I think kind of vanished around the turn of the the century so this is to be completely upfront this is a very kind of uh you know there's no no hard kind of 
indication that this is happening yet. Yeah. But Restoration Games, uh, which is the company be- behind Return to Dark Tower, Downforce, um, Sop Thief, uh, known for kind of taking older games, forgotten designs, bringing them back in a modern form, it is registered a trademark for Hero Quest Legacies. Uh, so that's that's essentially the new story. Um, the interesting thing here is so the the trademark was registered as intent to use. It's being registered as intent to use in relation to board games, card games, miniatures, that kind of thing. So it definitely seems in the ballpark. Um, and the interesting thing here is there was an attempt to bring Hero Quest back a few years ago um, by a Spanish publisher. Uh, whose name I am just double checking Game Zone in 2013 so they launched a Kickstarter campaign for a new Hero Quest game and that Kickstarter campaign was eventually cancelled due to a copyright claim by uh, role playing game publisher Moon Design Publications so this is where it gets legally very messy uh, take this with a grain of salt obviously none of us are lawyers none of us know the, the complete ins and outs of the situation but the the general overview of it is Hero Quest, after it faded away as a board game, the name Hero Quest was picked up by Greg Stafford, known for Rune Quest, uh, the RPG, among others. And he then created an RPG called Hero Quest, not related to the board game. So that name was then registered as an RPG by Stafford's company, or the company putting out Stafford's work, uh, which is Moon Design. So they held the name of hero quest but in relation to the rpg not the board game um but as of earlier this year chaosium the call of cthulhu and runequest publisher which now publishes hero quest the role-playing game everyone everyone keeping up this is like i'm mm-hmm. so <laughs> yeah they, they, i'm making notes they changed the name of hero quest the role-playing game to quest worlds um so it kind of opened up the name of hero quest potentially to be used for something else which if this trademark filing proves true you know comes to fruition could be a new board game from restoration games um so we did in fact reach out to restoration games um and founder and president uh, justin d jacobson basically said we're always looking at our top five requested games and taking steps to see if we can make them securing a trademark is one step but it's not the only step we have many pieces to put together for all our games before we have the rights to make them Trademarks are a public piece of the puzzle and unfortunately convey a lot more implied weight than is justified. Importantly, what we filed was under the USPTO intent to use provision. Uh, If and when there's something to announce, believe us, folks will know. So, you know, that's their kind of thing is like, yeah, we've we've done the trademark, but it doesn't mean anything yet. I just think it's an interesting, Mm. you know, there's movement finally on on a game that i think a lot of people would like to see come back there's been a lot of attempts to make spiritual successes over the years um but an an actual hero quest game could be very interesting to see in the year 2020 or 2021 2 3 4 5 whenever it might appear yeah i think people would genuinely be really interested in all of the tabletop communities i'm part of on like uh, facebook or uh, you know twitter or whatever there's always somebody who's just acquired a copy of hero quest and is starting to paint all the miniatures up like mm-hmm. constantly um it's still just people absolutely love it yeah i think it's for those who haven't played it i think the the original game is very popular because it had a lot of 3d terrain and miniatures in the box so it looked really impressive when set up it looked like the kind of D layout you'd have with a, a group but kind of all in one box which i think was a lot of the appeal uh, also it had a fantastic tv advert very much of the time Ruled sword. Yeah, uh, which you can find <laughs> on YouTube, and I would highly recommend doing so. Uh, yeah. I would also recommend if you've not seen it, they're just it's the best thing about Hero Quest, which is a guy with uh, fantastic long hair and a beard, just going the best thing about Hero Quest uh, at the start of every single sentence <laughs> and naming something different. It's a tiny furniture. Uh, it's great. It's, <laughs> it's probably <wonderful. laughs> ruled sword. Anyway, yeah, mm-hmm. that's your homework for the day. All right, uh, let's round out news with. Uh, a slightly smaller story, but I think one that those who've been following Dicebreaker since the beginning, in fact, uh, will be interested in hearing. Mian, what's this about a new set of watch expansion? Oh! Jo- Johnny's face. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a new set of watch expansion coming. Um, the first, 
uh, in, since, since the game's release last year. Um, it is called Swords of the Coin, uh, and it is a standalone expansion, so it can be played on its own or with the original set of watch. And it introduces four new characters, uh, the Barbarian, the Heretic, the Witch, and the Bounty Hunter. And they all introduce some new abilities um, and dice and things like that. Uh, and there's also a new mechanic around gaining money uh, when you perform certain actions in the camp. And then that money can be used to buy new items that can you know, heal you and protect you and do various other things. Um, there's also going to be some new locations included in there. Uh, I th imagine there'll probably be some new monsters. I, one would well. hope. One mm. would definitely hope. Mm. Uh, more wolves, some owls. Oh yeah, maybe. Maybe an imp. Just maybe. more variety would be great. It's um, the only area in which Set Watch falls down. <laughs> Um, I believe the game on it's going to be on Kickstarter. Um, the the date for the Kickstarter is well. Um, the one of the artists who worked on the game uh, has said that it's going to be on Kickstarter on the twenty second of September. Obviously, that isn't an official announcement, as far as I know. So take it with a grain of salt but um the core game will be available for uh 23 pounds no 22 pounds or 29 dollars so not bad um yeah it'll be nice to get some more set of watch stuff i don't think it's going to be entirely different from the original but um it's got some interesting new characters and a cool mechanic for sure. So and go. if you haven't played Set of Watch awesome. or heard of it, uh, you can check out Johnny's review uh, from mm. from the days of yore um, <laughs> on <Yeah>. Dice Breaker. <laughs> the before times. Exactly. The before times, yeah. Uh, there's also a Let's Play, I believe. Oh, God, will. it goes so badly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> for uh, a video. Yeah. You know what? Just, just, just prepare yourself. <laughs> it's like no country for old men. Jesus. Yeah. All right. Anyway, there That's you go. That's about it for news. Uh, there's a couple of new releases out this week uh, that are probably just quickly worth mentioning. So there's, as well as the Kickstarter for Set a Watch, um, there is a Kickstarter currently running for Lizard Wizard, uh, which is the new game from the people that made Raccoon Tycoon. Uh, so they definitely know how to make a good <laughs> name for a board game. Yes, they do. Um, it's set in the same world, so it's, as the name implies, a load of animal... Um, characters casting spells at each Mostly other. Mostly lizards, yeah. I believe. Mostly lizards. Yes. I think there are some toads in there as well. <laughs> Technically that, amphibians. Mate? Raccoon Tycoon is stuff with cats and dogs. Yeah. I suppose. Loads of, loads of them. Uh, yeah, so there's there's that currently up. Uh, then out just in general. Um, so we are going by the Ismodi UK release sheet because it's kind of one of the, the easiest places to see what's coming out. Is the second edition of the big... Speaking of large sci-fi strategy games in the wake of Twilight Imperium, Eclipse, which has anyone played it? The original Eclipse, I think Dawn for the Galaxy is its no. subtitle. Mm -mm. No. So it's it's in the vein of Twilight Imperium. It was kind of like a hey, we really liked that game, but we want it to have more of the combat and less of the kind of political dealings. Um, so if you're more into loads <laughs> of ships slamming into each other, that's that's Eclipse. Um, oh, I love so that. the second edition of Eclipse is called Second Dawn for the Galaxy um, and it's out it's £140 is the RRP oh, which is wow, yeah. a lot of money um, yes. I actually really like the original Eclipse um, but I kind of played it before I'd played Twilight Imperium or other games like that and I think nowadays I'd probably go to TI over Eclipse um, but hey, if you're into into more of the combat side, Eclipse is there for you. Like, it looks pretty good. Um, it's a bigger, kind of more visually impressive version of the first game. There's some gameplay improvements. There's a whole load of miniatures, as you'd expect. Uh, so, yeah, that is out. And then, also, a new edition of not quite as old a game is Century Golem Edition Eastern Mountains, which is an interesting one because there's... So, Golem Edition is the re-theming of the Century series, which most people know from Century Spice Road. 
uh, which kind of turn it into a fantasy game rather than a historical spice trading game. Okay. Uh, so Eastern Mountains is the second game in the series. Um, and this is the fantasy retheming of that. And they recently announced the third and final one yeah. of the trilogy, uh, which originally a new world and now it's something different. Uh, yeah, let's not worry about it. It's something world. <laughs> it, I think it is something world. I can't remember exactly. But this but... appears to be Eastern Mountains appears to be getting a slightly wider release because I think previously it was only really available at conventions or directly from the publisher. Um, so this means it might hmm. pop up in your local game shop. Um, obviously, if you're Ooh. venturing out, obviously please be safe. Wear a mask. Um, look after those around you and yourself. Um, but if you are out and about looking for games, you may see it. All right. Shall we do some emails? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, this one comes in from Eric H. Vela. Uh, rolling a one in D&D. Natural one, epic fail or fumble? And then a slightly more broad-ranging question. How far do your TTG experiences go? Well, I assume TTRPGs, tabletop role-playing games. Mm. Experiences go, and how have things changed since? Um, is that in terms of... Uh what do we call a one? Yeah, what do you call a one? A natural one, epic fail, or fumble? Um, we call it a crit fail. Mm, yeah, same. I would call it a crit fail. Or I just call it a one. Because <laughs> I think, it's like, I rolled a one. It's such a, yeah. a painful thing to have to admit. Um, oh. The Oxenturist call it a critical one. And I don't know why, but it really gets my back up. <laughs> <laughs> so there's only one one on the D20. So. Yeah. I think I'm I'm just a I'll say natural one if it makes sense mm. because sometimes it can make mm. a difference. If not, I'll just say one. Yeah, like I don't know, critical fail is I think odd for me, but I think that's good just because I associate critical hit as like bam. But I, don't, I normally yeah. don't call a twenty a critical hit either or a critical roll. I just call it a, a nat twenty or a twenty. Oh, critical roll. Mm. Huh. That's there you go. Lonely's ready for. Or... God, I don't know. I just say whatever. The great one um, debate. <laughs> I don't really listen to myself when I talk, so I have no idea what I say. Uh, <laughs> I probably say crit one actually. I think because um, I think I think it's quite fun to go. No, no, but here, listen to my reasoning. I think it's quite fun to go. Ah, oh, crit, and then they're like, you know, everyone assumes you you got a twenty, and then you go crit one, and then it's like, oh, oh. nice. <laughs> I'm still not a fan. <laughs> I apologise. Big, big bungle. Big bungle. Big bungle. Big bungle. Mm. Uh, and yeah, so the, the second half of Eric's question is how far do your tabletop role playing experiences go back? And have they changed since? I hmm. only started playing role playing games in January 2018, I think. Was that, was that it? Yeah, 2018. Um, they've changed quite a bit I guess um, I started by not doing theatre of the mind so the, the uh, DM that ran my first game like obviously had it with like little miniatures and maps and, and stuff like that um, I guess I, I've i learned what to do to some extent like things not to do like don't leave dead bodies lying around when you know that one of them has escaped and is going to tell the rest of them don't let anyone escape <laughs> wow if you just killed all their Jeez. friends <laughs> dark um, stuff huh because they will come back for you uh yeah just i have learned a lot of things along the way um i think um i'm trying to like think more outside the box i guess uh and i'm still working on that i feel like i've been playing for two years or something but um i still have a lot to to do and try and stuff <laughs> i've also played a lot of different like role-playing games which has been quite nice because i started with D D, um and that's mostly what i've played but obviously like especially through dicebreaker i've been playing a lot of different things so it's like i think it's quite handy like playing different rpgs because you tend to think differently in different s scenarios and obviously um depending on like you were saying earlier like blades there's so many opportunities to do so many things like that makes you think about things completely differently than when you know another game has a different set of rules and you're thinking within that kind of world and rule set mm -hmm. 
Mm. I don't know if that answered the question. I just kind of talked for a while. No, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that works. <laughs> what about you, Matt? <laughs> so I think I've chatted before on this podcast. Like, I started with Pathfinder. That was kind of my way in. I didn't play very. I didn't play D and D really until Dicebreaker properly on on a regular basis. Um, but I started with Pathfinder. But I think the version of Pathfinder we played stripped out a lot of the crunchier rules. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like Lolis. We started out with miniatures, we had cardboard maps and grids, um, and that group in general uh, is the same group I now play Monster of the Week with, so we've shifted completely to Theatre of the Mind, and I would generally never really go back to using a load of miniatures and grids and measuring out ranges and distances, because I think Mm. I've realised that I just have so much more fun when it's flexible. You're basically, the focus is the story rather than the crunchy maths and you know I don't want to play a war game I don't want to play a strategy game when I'm playing an RPG those things are fine like I enjoy them separately but when I'm playing an RPG I want to tell a really fun story with friends Um, so that's kind of been where I've shifted and partly through my job like the last six seven years or so um, just again trying out different RPGs and realizing that I like lower lower overhead rules that just move away from I'm so tired in some ways of fantasy um particularly crunchy fantasy oh. like I think there are there's room to play around with those things but yeah like lasers and feelings is a perfect example um trail of cthulhu which I love like the investigation side of things monster of the week I've said we're, before we're kind of playing a post harry potter hogwarts mystery investigation team um which is massively enjoyable uh, so that's where I'm at. No more miniatures, please. Where are you, Lynn? Oh, me. Um, so I've been playing tabletop RPGs since... I'm going to say 2012. Because uh, I'm fairly sure I played my first RPG when I was in uni. Um, and it was D&D. Fourth edition, I think, at the time. Um... I think it was 4th edition. It was either 3rd or 4th edition. Uh, and, you know, it was alright. Like, we... I don't think we did a full grid miniatures. Um, but we definitely did a more crunchier version. But I think that was just the nature of D&D back then. Um, I'm saying back then. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, from there, I kind of didn't play it hugely regularly. But uh, we would have the occasional sort of weekend where we would just play a full on one shot Uh, and then I played Pathfinder for a bit which mm, was alright I played on D20 um, because we were uh, kind of separated by distance so we used an online um, tool which was okay Um, I'm not a huge fan of Pathfinder Um, and then I started experimenting with things like Dread and uh, then systems like the ones we played for Dicebreaker, so um, Quest and yeah, Blades in the Dark. Um, I think so. In terms of like time-wise, from 2012 till now, um, I think there's been a lot more sort of experimental RPGs introduced. Um, I think fan-made, so like ama- you know, community amateur-made RPGs are a lot more kind of in and easily accessible now uh, thanks to things like itch.io and stuff like that um so i'm more aware of that kind of community side of things but also like the huge amount of indie rpg creators you know outside of the big ones like dvd are out there making really interesting things uh that think outside of the box and don't maybe focus so much on combat rules and more on sort of immersive experiences and telling stories with your friends so um yeah all right um i st- i actually started in 2012 myself um sort of early doors um playing uh, deadlands funnily enough and since then i have played a lot of games and the biggest shift has been that i now run them a lot and i don't play them ever but i you know sometimes i run them for money and that's nice uh what's changed in terms of the things i appreciate is probably i i get more excited 
by novel mechanics nowadays than I do an interesting setting. Before I was like, oh my god, this game's so cool because you're playing in space and there's all this <laughs> these jump gates and stuff. You know, like I, I, I was so excited about Fading Suns and now I'm like, I would only recommend that game to a specific group of people because it is one of the crunchiest D20 systems I've ever um, encountered. Um, well, is that true? Yes, it is. Sod it. Uh, whereas, you know, now like I get really excited about stuff like um, the Hot Wall system, uh like uh, where if you succeed really well you get to add a trait to your character um, which is uh, you know um, situation specific so if you if you rolled to drive a car and you did it really well you could then give yourself a, a trait that would be like whenever you use whenever you're driving now you get to use like stunt driver or whatever so you get better at the things you've accidentally been good at and it, it's meaningful character progression um, and kind of effectively leveling up just through play but then as a consequence of failure, you can have those things stripped away from you. And it's just a much more fluid system that means that the re like your character is good at things for a reason. Uh, and it's stuff like that that really excites me now. Um, and so, yeah, like, I guess I've, I've become the epitome of that meme where people are like, my first ever character is like, they're a paladin. They have a super tragic backstory and they want to kill everyone. And then, you know my characters now it's like i'm a piece of bread being carried around by mage hand at all times <laughs> yeah i all i want to do is file my tax return on time yeah like, i'm really enjoying being in that sort of phase of things just being like what is a weird character concept that mm -hmm. i can try and make meaningful mm -hmm. yeah so, that uh, lolies would you like to read this next one from paul sure thing matt <laughs> paul thanks lolies <laughs> Oh, but it's a lowly on the floor. <laughs> Paul C. Lamprey asks, "Oh my God, it's red. Um, oh, sorry. That was what a bit board too game? Keen. What board game world would you like, like least slash least like to be trapped in slash come to life, Jumanji style?" Oh, there so our house gets exploded by it and stuff. Does the house explode in Jumanji? I suppose it gets damaged quite considerably, doesn't it? Yeah. It's crocodile. I, I was thinking I think about it's... this because uh, I read the I read the question earlier, and um, I I think a world that I'd love to be in is Cult Express. Um, oh. I just think like that's already like I feel like they've already like built a little bit of a world there with the with the three D train and everything, um, and it's just I like I like the Wild West as an idea. Obviously, I probably hate it if I was there because people are shooting at me, but um, <laughs> but it still is. It's I think it would be quite an exciting one too. To get into and try and figure out. Oh. I guess the fact that I know how each of the characters, uh, what their special abilities are, that would help me if I actually was there. Because <laughs> I'd know that, <laughs> I don't know, Django can shoot up. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you get like really meta with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Hmm. I think on a similar line, it wouldn't be any fun, but I really like. Like I say, I really like investigation games, so kind of the Arkham Horror series. Although the world itself, deeply unpleasant, mm -hmm. I really like the idea of going around investigating cult mysteries and whatnot. Um, and I think they generally do a pretty good job of that. Outside of that, just, you know, put, stick me in the, the universe of train games, just let me ride around on trains all day. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Tobago also would be another one I'd love to be in, because you're, like, exploring for treasure, driving around in your car. You're that cheap. would be good. Yeah. I'm kind of struggling. I think I'd love to be trapped in root. Like, Aww. it's How just... How about Fort? <laughs> no, like, you couldn't pay me enough to go and be a child again. It's yeah. a horrible thing to be. Um, uh, yeah, is root a complete cop-out answer? I just think it's like, I like the fact that it's such a small forest, but it everything matters so much, but it's mm. also kind of cutesy, and it's like... It's it's almost like uh, when kids are like, we're going to have a war for the river, and they accidentally get two into it. Mm. And it's like, wow, this is really serious, but also I feel safe. That kind I was going to say, are you, are you yeah, like the faction? human watching the animals kind of scrap around and going, oh, look at those animals? Or are you a an animal of some kind mm. joining? I'd probably be part of the Woodland Resistance. Mm. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that. Or I'd be the Vagabond. Just sort of bimbling around, being like, "All right, you got any root tea? 
I'll give you a card for it. <laughs> Just sort of having a, having a little bimble. Uh, and please, for the love of God, don't suck me into the world of uh, Warhammer 40,000. Yeah, no. It sounds <laughs> universally awful in everyone's fash. Mm. Um, hmm, for me, it would probably be either. So a universe I'd want to be in would either be Camelot. Because oh my I god, love, the I love stacking would be amazing. <laughs> I love the idea of just lounging about in a chair, a having show. like like mint juleps, and just watching camels just riding around. Uh, and yeah, my life is just sitting here having a fun time. It's the least surprising thing I've ever heard about you <laughs> is I'd like to be lying back drinking mint juleps watching camels stack on top of each other. Yeah. Uh, I was about to be like, oh, Camelop's just the real real world to some degree. I was like, oh, right, yeah, the too, camels don't, they don't stack. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the camels are stacking on top of one another and they're perfectly fine with it. Like, you know, they're, they're okay. Uh, <laughs> or it would be like, or Cat Lady, because then I could just have loads of cats come and live in my house and no one would think I was weird about it and like as long as I had enough food it would never be a problem like that's just real life man yeah but I can't have like infinite cats come and live in my flat because then my landlord wouldn't like it yeah. oh, if it makes you feel any better about that uh, even if you have loads of food in the house there's never enough food this cats is are true. always bemoaning the injustice of how little food there is out, oh. even when there is food out. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as enough food in the vicinity for a cat. And if there is not, a, if there is not food out, they will find it. Uh, speaking yes. from experience. Uh, the world I wouldn't want to be in? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to be something like, like, either horror related, like, yeah, I wouldn't want to be in Arkham Horror because... The, the the old gods are coming to kill us all, um, all like betrayal, because then your friend betrays you, and then there's giant spiders or something, um, or like something really boring, like because um, like like pipeline is just like real life, right? But you're but you're in the business of electricity. Is that what pipeline's about again? It's it oil, like, I think. Oil. Mm. That would make sense. Yeah. I don't want to work in an oil refinery. If anyone's right. listening and they do, I uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the important work that you do. I, I'm not saying it sucks. I'm no, just I saying I'm I just, wouldn't I'm, want to. I'm just hedging our bets. Uh, all right, let's take a oh, third and final one. I just, uh, just because I never mentioned what game I'd hate to be in, I was looking at my shelf thinking, like, which game would I hate to be in? And I was looking and I was like, Pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Too yeah. real, mm. ladies. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs> anyway, move right. on. Uh, Johnny, would you like to read this third and final one from Shah Harrison, please? Uh, I'll be honest with you, Matt. I don't know if I have the doc up. In fact, I do <laughs> have it up, but if I get the doc out, then it will mess up the uh, video. Oh, I okay. Can, so I if I could cry off. I haven't sure. read one yet. I'll do it. It's fine. Go for it. Um, hi, Dice Baker crew. Hello. Johnny's recent <laughs> series with Luke from Oxtra on how to GM tabletop RPGs has been a fantastic way for me to gain more confidence in running some tabletop RPG campaigns that hmm. I've recently taken over as GM. My question is, how would you propose a new RPG to a group of regular players? I picked up Blaze in the Dark recently and have devoured the rulebook I'd love to run a session with my current D&D crew, but they seem reluctant to switch off D&D. How would you go about convincing them to try something new, even as a one-shot or a breather from our long-term campaign? Thanks a bunch, Char Harrison. Uh, Char like Sar. Char. Char. Oh! It's short for Charlotte, okay. Char Harrison. Uh, I would say... Um... It's like it, it can be a bit of a battle getting people to pick up a new RPG. So just think of it as a series of pitches. Um, first thing can be like, there's this game I'd really like us to try for a session. And, you know, sometimes there'll be enough that they'll be like, okay, well, we can give it a go. It'd be like, it's in this cool setting where 
everything is ghosts. The city is surrounded by a wall of lightning to keep out more ghosts. And every inch of the city is controlled by criminals. And you're the newest criminal gang. And then <laughs> stop for a bit. And then, you know, you can go back and be like, so this game, you know, if you want to know a bit more about it, I don't know. Like, <laughs> you don't do any planning forward, so it's really quick. So what you do is you plan backwards because you can call a flashback at any time and blah, 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 blah. And then leave it for a bit. Let it sort of settle. Um, and then just don't shut up about it. Oh. Like, uh, my my brother, like, uh, he uses the phrase, uh, the, the term, like, squeaky wheel protocol. It's like, if you've got a, if you've got a trolley and the wheel's squeaking, eventually you'll fix it it's like just sometimes you just gotta be a squeaky wheel you just gotta just gotta <laughs> keep great. at it and people will go like yeah. oh great fine um and if that doesn't work just try criticizing D D constantly <laughs> be like all right i mean i don't think this system's particularly good but i need you to make me a wisdom perception roll i guess <laughs> oh gosh wow <laughs> wow this real passive aggressive like and if that doesn't campaign. work get aggressive um no, Start no, punching was, people. But... This is what happened to you if you don't play this game. <laughs> this Whoa. is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. We um, don't condone violence on Dice Breaker. No. No. Uh, no, I, I don't, don't, don't neg the game everyone's playing uh, to, to convince them to play another one. It will make them resentful. Mm. But uh, yeah, just be enthusiastic and hopefully they'll follow. Yeah. I think it's... Oh, at some point you might have to kind of accept that a game might not be for your group even if you really want to play it so you might have to either find another group or just kind of find another game that you're also interested in playing you know some some groups just won't gel with certain games but i think uh, kind of suggesting them as like you say as like a breather or a kind of little rester because everyone at some point needs a bit of a just a break you know just to recharge maybe get some ideas about their character in a different game and so just trying something light you know, as long as you're not diving into, I don't know, Invisible Sun, um, or something like that, <laughs> something wow. horrifically, you know, over the top. If you're just like, oh, you know, Power by the Apocalypse is a great system. Get two d six, easy peasy. Like we're rolling. You know, let's let's do that. Or like Johnny says, Blaze in the Dark is perfect system. It's really easy to learn. It's just d sixes. I think even just having a different die shape can be can just break you away enough where it's like, oh, not another d twenty game. So, yeah, I would just be, yeah, be upfront about it. You can just be like, hey, I feel like taking a bit of a break, you know. Mm. Does anyone have any suggestions? I'd like to play this. Let's find something that we're all interested in and go mm. from there. I think it's often, so for me, trying to convince other people to play an RPG, it's often like when I convince people to give Dread a go, like, obviously, if you offer to GM it, that's already, like, taking a weight off them. Um... But also, like, yeah, like, push the parts of, like, the setting that you think are really cool. So, like, if you, with Dread, you can come up with, you know, whatever survival horror setting you like. So if you create one that you're like, oh, my friends are going to be really into this, then you'll be like, oh, yeah, it's going to be set, you know, uh, around this, you know, think of, like, Alien or, like, The Thing or whatever your inspirations are kind of for it. Um, like, push what maybe mechanics are really different from what you're playing right now um so like dread has a jenga tower um if you like try and push the elements that make it seem like fresh but in a way that your you know your group's going to like then because a lot of people just don't come off DD because they're reticent to try something new like that's often the case a lot of people just like to stick to what they know and if you can like push it in a way that's that's you know makes it appealing enough that they want to take that that step, then yeah, you're probably going to either be successful or yeah, just try another group. Like uh, there are plenty of people out there who want to play RPGs. Sometimes you yeah. just got to look in different places. Worst case scenario, mm -hmm. you're about to make a whole bunch of new friends. Yeah. Lolies, what are your thoughts? Yep. <laughs> I don't know, I've never um I've never been yep. in that situation. Um Yeah, I mean Yeah, I don't really I don't think I have really anything to add to that. I just don't don't really have an insight into trying to convince a group of people to 
play a different RPG because I've never convinced a group of people to actually play an <laughs> RPG <laughs> in the first place. Ah, all right. I think that is about all <gasps> we've got time for on this slightly abbreviated uh, Dicebreaker podcast for this week. Uh, but before we go, Johnny and Lolis, what do we have coming up on the video side on youtube.com forward slash Dicebreaker? Such a good question. <laughs> think you're gone, um, think you're gone. So, we sh- yes, <laughs> the podcast. Uh, obviously, Dungeon Breaker. Uh, we have uh, played Codenames with uh, with Prozy D, so we'll be putting that up. There are some other things. Next week, we'll have some form of Pandemic Season Zero review. Um, and other things mine's gone blank i know we pushed something back sunday where we've got a video of how to play azul yep uh oh. which actually we teased last week surprise we haven't published it yet <laughs> uh and we'll have something on on fort and uh lowly's thoughts on it lowly's thoughts on that's fort. next week thoughts on fort. yeah that's yeah but it's it's the podcast goes out on friday so it's the next in the coming sort of week and a, a bit i guess I, just, I was just I was panicking. I was trying to think of things. <laughs> How about that website? <laughs> <laughs> How about that website? Um over on dicebreaker.com we will have a text review of Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. Um based on my thoughts going through the campaign. We will have a we will have Mian's thoughts on Fort. <gasps> so we'll have two kind of opinions that, uh, from, oh, from the Alex's Low Lee's and out. Mian. Yeah, that's Fort that's on so. Fort. That should be out <laughs> today. So oh, you can yes. go to the website. And look at dicebreaker.com and find my review of Fort. Yeah. Uh, we, as of a couple of days ago, by the time you're hearing this, um, Rob Whelan had some hands on time with the new Vampire the Masquerade game, Rivals, uh, the expandable card game that's coming up on Kickstarter next week. Uh, I think that goes live August 4th, um, which sounds kind of interesting. He kind of compared it to uh, Android Netrunner a little bit. Um, and obviously it's based in the world of the RPG, so there's a bunch of vampires stalking around the streets of San Francisco. Mm. Um, there are also... Um, Jason Coles has put together some looks at the latest Magic the Gathering set, the Core Set 2021, uh, kind of picking out some of the best cards for that, if you are interested in getting into it. Um, and we will have some other bits and bobs uh, in the next week, but I think that's a pretty good overview of what we've got lined up on both sides. Oh. Uh, so that's youtube.com slash dicebreaker and dicebreaker.com and um, Matt Jarvis where could people get a shirt like Johnny's where can people get a shirt like Johnny's for be audio nice, uh, roll uh, dice. listeners it, yeah the be nice roll dice shirt um, and actually the shirt I'm wearing oh! which is wood for sheet which is wood off screen um, although of course if you're listening to the podcast in audio form we're all off screen. Um, <laughs> the calls are coming from inside the house. Uh, so we all the existing shirts are already up. Our new summer range of merchandise, in fact, is shipping out. Uh, not next week as of this podcast going up, but the week of August 10th. Um, so from August 10th onwards. Just in time for the summer. Exactly. Uh, so that includes a water bottle, a drink your paint water mug. <laughs> Uh, just in just in time for the bit of summer anyone cares about, Lois. <laughs> My birthday. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've got a water bottle, a mug, a new shirt, a zip hoodie, all sorts of bits and bobs. If you're interested in those, uh, you can find them over on dicebreaker.myshopify.com. Oh. Uh, and we will have some more bits arriving in the future. Uh, mm. And we now post to most places around the world i know there are a couple more places that folks are waiting on and we are looking into it um but i think if you're in the mainland us and most of europe and whatnot we'll be able to get some stuff out to you so go and check it out but until we return next friday with the next dicebreaker podcast uh thank you for joining me alex lowley's thanks for having me thank you for joining us johnny chiadini thank you very much for having me also (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Alex Meehan. Finger guns! <laughs> and I've been Matt Jarvis. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Stay safe, wear a mask, and we will be back next week. Until then, have a lovely day. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.